And his God, his Jesus, the Son of God, come in and walk in with Adam and Eve daily. This is the heart of God. This is the desire of God that every day he would walk and talk with you. Oh, sure, not physically like back then, but he is here in the power of his Holy Spirit. He represents himself in his by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. For as many as receive him, the Bible says, he gives the power to become sons and daughters of the Most High God. The greatest gift that we all like sheep had turned our backs. And let's be honest, so many of us, uh, hopefully not so much now, but certainly in days gone by, and even now we look around the world and man has their backs turned on God. We are living selfish, proud uh, lives that just seek after our own desires. Do what you want to do, be what you want to be, yeah. You know. Uh, and, and, and we have totally shunned and ignored the commandments of God to love Him first with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and then love your neighbour as yourself. Now, no one hates them. Oh, we might feel a bit dejected and rejected and a bit sorry for ourselves. You know, we've all been down the, the pitiful road from time to time and, and uh, get stuck there occasionally. But generally speaking, we care for our... Look at how, how most of us, are well, most of us are well <laughs> dressed this morning. But, you know, we take time to groom our hair and to brush our teeth and to put on some nice clothes. This time of the year or after Christmas, I'm sure we'll have gift vouchers and go shopping for new clothes. And, and yeah... Uh, and, and we love that. So we like to adorn ourselves and generally make ourselves handsome just like me. <laughs> or beautiful, just like my wife in the front row. Right there. Uh, and, and we love to do that. You know, so we do care for our bodies. We, don't, we try to you know, look after ourselves, don't we? And the Bible says, care for others just in the same manner, in the same care that you care for yourself. Care for one another. Now, interesting, it says, first of all, love God. I believe we can't truly love others until we truly love God. Because God is love. And he reciprocates that love and fills our life, fills our hearts, fills our souls, our whole being with his love, which we then can pour out and know, first of all, you need to be loved to love. Yeah. You know, sadly, there's many around the world today who were brought up in hard families, hard, sad situations where they perhaps did not have the true love of a father or of a mother or either. But let me say that God is love. He is our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. He is the Father of all fathers. He is the greatest example. And he even talks in his Bible, listen, if you ask for bread, I'm not going to give you a snake. If you ask for something, I'm not going to give you poison. I'm going to, he loves you. He loves you. Let me say that again. God loves you. You were created by him. You were designed by the great designer. Created by the great creator. He has a purpose. He has a plan. You are special. You are precious to God. Let's not forget that. Now, I'm not talking about humanism here. You know, in, in fact, let me, uh, I looked up this morning, I was going to, I haven't even started sharing what I thought I'd share this morning. That doesn't matter. Um, but um, I did, here we go here. Interesting, because I, I, I thought, you know, what is this world? Well, there's a big push of humanism. And I was going to share a little bit this morning, and I still may, a little bit on surrendering our lives to God and allowing God to take control. You know, uh, Really, there's no better person to have control of our lives than God. He's above all. He is all. He knows the best for you. He has a perfect plan and will for your life. And we can get lost. We can get sidetracked. We can get distracted, led astray. But if we come back to God and yield our lives to God, I can promise you, according to his word, that all things will work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. The secret in life is to know our, to know God. 
the secret in life is to know what is the purpose and the will of God and live it and seek it. Amen. In fact, James says, find out what pleases God and do it. Find out what is the will of God and live it. And God desires and he promises us this. When he rose from the dead on the third day, the Son of God rose from the dead, appeared to hundreds of people. And he, when he ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father, the Son of God, right now, seated in heavenly places at the right hand of Almighty God. And he's there to to stand up for you. And he says, if you stand up for me in this life right now, then I will stand up for you on that day. What day is that? It is a day that is coming that no one can avoid, that no one will, will miss when we all stand before God and give an account of our lives here on earth. The 70, 105 years, whatever it is that we live. Uh, I say that for the 105, any 105 year olds here? No. Oh, Getting close. 95. Is that right? Four. Four. Nearly. I keep saying five. Yeah. Um, it won't be long. It won't be long. You're in your 95th year. 90, you're in your 95th year. That's it. Yeah. That there will, will come a day, the Bible says, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess him as Lord and God Almighty. There will come a day of reckoning where we will all stand before God and give an account of how we lived our lives. Did we live? our lives to please God or did we live our lives to serve our own selfish needs my prayer is this that right now we we understand the will of God for you and for me that we hear the call of God in Revelation he says behold I stand at your door and knock on your door those who hear my voice and open the door I shall come in and in fact he says my father and I we shall come in and sup abide within you. God doesn't live in temples made by man. God lives in hearts who are open wide. God, you are the living temple of God. Let us not, let us not uh, miss the opportunity. Let us not miss the great invitation from heaven. Let us not miss the greatest gift ever given. The Son of God sent from heaven to earth that came as a babe that lived and breathed and, and experienced everything that you and I experienced. There was no temptation. There was no hardship. And let me tell you, uh, life was much harder back then than it is today. I'm sure we have other pressures and other things and, and, and perhaps that are in our face now. But back then, just life was hard, you know. Um, and he lived it. And the Bible says he was without sin. The Bible says that, and I might read to you from Philippians. I'm going to read from the Amplified version uh, chapter 2 it says therefore if there is any encouragement and comfort in Christ as there certainly is in abundance if there be any consolation of love if there is any fellowship that we share in the spirit if there is any great depth of affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind having the same love towards one another knit together in spirit intent on one purpose and living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel that is the good news regarding salvation through faith in Jesus Christ do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit through factions or motives or wrong motives or strife selfishness but with an attitude of humility, neither, being neither arrogant or self-righteous, regard others as more important than yourselves. This is the spirit of Christmas. That God sent His only Son to die. And Christ and Jesus thought Himself not high and mighty, he, he laid aside his glory. He laid aside his reputation. He laid aside everything that he possessed at that moment in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And he humbled himself in obedience unto God, his Father, and came to earth. The Son of God who bled and died who was crucified upon a Roman, cruel Roman cross, who was beaten, who was humiliated, who was rejected by his own creation, who was despised, who was mocked, 
this act of selflessness and obedience unto God his Father. And let me read it, what it says about that right here. Having the same attitude in yourselves which was in Christ Jesus. Look to him as our example in selfless humility. Who although he existed in the form of unchanging essence of God. As one with him possessing the fullness of all the divine attributes. The entire nature of the deity. God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or asserted but emptied himself humbled himself and took the form of a bond servant of a man and being made in the likeness of man he came completely human but was without sin being fully God yet fully man after he was found in outward appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, what reason? Because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself. God has highly exalted him and bestowed him that on him the name which is above every name. So that at the on that on the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. And those who are in heaven and those who are on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ, the sovereign God, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was given a name above every name. This I find this fascinating. This is where he was given the name. Jesus. Why? He was given a name above every name and all of that name incorporates the power and the authority in that name bestowed upon Jesus. Why was he given it? He was given it because he humbled himself and laid aside his glory and his reputation and he humbled himself into obedience unto God his Father. Wow. If he hadn't obeyed, if he hadn't humbled himself, we would not have the name of Jesus. That is a result. And let me tell you, we know it right through Proverbs, it talks about he who humbles himself, God will exalt. He who is proud and arrogant, God will cast down. But it is to the humble. Let's look at the, the great Beatitudes, the, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus shared. Blessed are the humble, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, the low in spirit. Not the high and mighty arrogant person, but he that humbles himself under the hand of Almighty God, God will lift up and exalt. They come from the example of Jesus. That although he was everything, he laid it all aside. And that's why Jesus also asked the same of you and the same of me. Although you may have everything, he says, I'm asking you to put it all aside and come and follow me. Romans 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice on the altar is the living sacrifice keeps jumping off the altar. <laughs> That's why the sacrifice must be slain and laid on the altar. That which is dead cannot keep jumping off the altar. But if we truly die with Christ, then we shall also be resurrected with Him. It is only the dead that is resurrected. If you want to be resurrected, then die now. That you'll be resurrected later. I'm talking spiritually here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your logical, rational, expected, let me add, Act of worship. Listen, He has given all. He has given everything. The greatest sacrifice ever made. We owe Him our very lives. We owe Him our complete pardon granted by Him. 
to us. The least we can do is live for him in everything. And put aside our own agenda, put aside our own desires, put aside our own will, and take up the will of God. As Jesus said, I came not to do my own will, but to do him who sent me. I came to do my Father's will. And even on that night of Gethsemane, under the greatest pressure that any person would ever know, he declared, yet, yeah, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself what is the will of God. That which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and in his purpose for you. I love Paul speaking in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. That is in him I have shared in his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. By adhering to and relying on and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Hallelujah. Emmanuel. We sung about it this morning. Emmanuel. God with us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So Romans 8, 12, 13 says this. And so then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. He repeats himself again in this scripture. Not to our flesh or human nature or our worldliness or our sinful capacity. We have a capacity to sin. Yes, of course we do. We all know that. But we have an obligation not to fulfill the old man's desire or the worldliness or a capacity to sin but we have an obligation to live not according to the impulses of the flesh which is our nature without the Holy Spirit I love that according to the impulses of the flesh which is when we yield when we yield to the flesh we say no to God we reject the voice of the Holy Spirit and we yield to the flesh. For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you are going to die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body, then you will really live forever. Don't you love that translation? Let me read it one more time. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation not to our flesh, our human nature, our worldliness or sinful capacity to live according to the impulses of the flesh, our nature without the Holy Spirit. For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you are going to die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body and you will really live forever. Hallelujah. That is why Jesus declares, if you want to be my disciple, if you really want to follow me and come after me, then you must deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I love John, John's Gospel and John the, um, the Baptist. He, he shares this, and I haven't seen it as a so it was clear this morning. It says, So this pleasure and joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, and I must decrease. When will your pleasure and joy really be complete? Only when he increases and you decrease. See, John was the talk of the town. He was baptizing 
men and women unto repentance. He had disciples. The whole Pharisees and Sadducees were out there listening to him. The whole known world at that point in that area was, was, it was all the talk was John the Baptist, John the Baptist. But as soon as Jesus came on the scene, he quit. And all his disciples deserted him and went to Jesus. It's true. And this is his response. So this pleasure <coughs> and joy of mine is now complete. What, when he finished his ministry, when he lost to his disciples, was no longer in the limelight? Yeah, that's right. He must increase. But I must decrease. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 22, that regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self. You completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude, and put on the new self, the regenerated, the renewed nature, created in God's image, God-like, in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. I think so many of us have missed that. This is coming out a little bit this morning, I hope, that it is, it is the least that we can do. It is the expectation. It is what we ought to naturally be indebted unto God. Lord, it's the least can do for you give you my life surrender my life for you gave your son for me and I will give my life to you hallelujah Galatians 6.14 but may it never be that I boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world hallelujah we must die yet we live yet not I live but Christ lives in me the preaching that is the gospel that I must decrease he must increase and then my joy will be made complete in the same manner looking unto Jesus who thought not equality with God but laid aside his reputation his glory who humbled himself and lived completely to serve his father in obedience and surrender who laid aside his own purpose importance will ego power position who laid it all aside to do the will of his father not my will but thy will be done that I boast in nothing but Christ and Him crucified through which the world has been crucified to me and I have been crucified to the world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In mind, I want us to. Bible says, when we gather together, we partake of the emblems representing the, the purpose for which Christ came. He came to die, to redeem us, to set us free. What was the purpose of his death? What was the purpose of his coming? 
to lead us to the Father. <laughs> sure, He died to forgive us of our sin, but that's what needs to happen. The purpose for Christ's coming was to restore us in f to fellowship and intimacy to God, His God, and our God, our Father who is in heaven. And so he says that as we come, let us gather together and let us partake of the cup and of the biscuit or bread, which simply represents and reminds us, bring to remembrance all that Christ has done for us. That while we were sinners, Christ died. Hallelujah. And so on this day, some 2,000 years ago, approximately, a little child was born in a, a manger in a stable. So there's no room in a motel. And so he went out to the stable and was born in a simple manner, environment. He lived experience everything that we do there's no temptation known to man that he was not tempted yet he was without sin as our example that's true and so let us partake together this morning we take the bread the biscuit that represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our peace, the chastisement for our peace was placed upon him and by his stripes we are healed body, soul and spirit. That's a complete healing. For he declares in Psalm 103, I am the Lord your God who forgives all your sin and heals all your diseases. As we partake this morning, we do it in remembrance. Remembrance of what? Of, his, of him. And of his word and all it means let's not take it lightly let's believe it let's take it in faith let's take it as his word that he does and he will forgive all our sin he does and he will heal all our diseases that's the same thing it's all together by his stripes you are healed your broken relationship with God is mended your sick body, your injury in your body is healed. He took it. He paid the price for it on the cross. He bore your sickness. So why you need not bear it anymore. Simply believe. And receive this morning.